really delighted you're here. We've got a great webinar this morning about um, the race to implementing the English language arts and literacy common core state standards. So let me give you a little bit of background here and let's get the, um, the webinar set up technically just in case anybody is um, uh, still struggling with any audio. Remember if um, you are online there's two ways you can hear us. You can use your voice over internet protocol through your computer speakers or you can dial in using the number on the screen with the access code. So a couple of ways you can get on to the webinar itself. And I want to say straight up, a lot of people are going to ask for a copy of the, the webinar. Um, we are going to make this um, recorded and you can download the webinar. We'll show you how to get that as well. So um, those, are, those are some of the um, connection options you have for the webinar. And then um, here are the protocols. You know, remember, we can't hear you. So it's just kind of a one-way um, um, session. But all you have to do is use your question function. We can monitor that and see what you're asking, and we can um, go ahead and answer your questions during the webinar. The private questions now, you're going to probably want to follow up with Lisa or myself if you have any additional questions or need additional documentation. And finally, we wanted to remind you to um, get in touch with Kyle Hefferich, our national sales manager. If you are interested in going further with any of the center services, Kyle can definitely help you there. And um, he'd be glad to um, give you more information about how you could um, work with Lisa or myself or anybody else in person. So um, take advantage of that. Remember now, if you go to the Resource Center on the Leadership and Learning website, you'll be able to download both the audio version of this and the PowerPoint as well. So we've got that all set up for you. A couple of reminders about our upcoming events. We've got a great Common Core State Standards Summit coming up in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's January 22nd and 23rd. Got great presenters including Larry Ainsworth, Dr. Angela Peary. And then I'll be with Lisa in um, Charlotte on April 24th and 25th. We've got our ELA Literacy Seminar. Lisa, again, will be in Chicago on June 6th and 7th, so that'll be a winner as well. Uh, and here's the other thing. We've got just a few more. I mean, this is the hot ticket now with the center. It's the Rigorous Curriculum Design Seminar. This is a 12-step design process to really help you implement the Common Core. It was authored by Larry Ainsworth. We've got several of these scheduled throughout the country, and we think you'll enjoy them. I mean, most people who attend the Rigorous Curriculum Design Seminar really, really enjoy the information, and they, it's applicable. You can start using it right away. So a couple of reminders there. Um, just to let you know, Lisa and myself and some of our colleagues have co-authored some of the books about navigating the implementation of the Common Core. You might want to take a, that, um, that series book. There's great, great information in there throughout the four series, including um, math as well. So we're happy to share those resources, and if you may want to um, investigate those a little bit further, you can take a closer look at the books at leadandlearn.com. All right, so let's go ahead and begin the, um, the webinar. I want to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Lisa Siebelak. Lisa is a professional development associate with the Leadership and Learning Center, and before she came out the cent with the center, she was a secondary literacy coach in her former district near Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was teaching English language arts, and she also taught an American International School in Costa Rica. So her whole family went there to do that work. Also, um, you have to understand something about Lisa. She is the Center's ELA Common Core Specialist. We've got the expert on the phone here. She has contributed to both a lot of our ELA Common Core Seminar Series and the Common Core State Standards Overview, Overview and then getting to the core of the Common Core State Standards for rigor, range, and relationships. She is the co-creator of Core Literacy, which is a seminar on reading and writing strategies to um, meet the rigor of the Common Core Standards. And she's, as I mentioned before, authored chapters in some of the books that we've published. So she's currently doing keynotes all over the country, and I know she's been spending quite a lot of time in Hawaii doing some work there as well. So um, everybody, here is Lisa Siebelak. Good morning, Lisa. How are you? Good morning, Steve. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. Good morning, everyone on the line. And I think I'd like to just go ahead and get started and really give you the big ideas for this webinar. And it really comes down to two key points. Um, the first one is all teachers must become teachers of literacy. And that is the message that we are trying to get out. Steve, are you hearing me OK? Yes. OK, can you click on? Thank you. And then here's the reason why. It's because the, the Common Core ELA and Literacy provide direction for how literacy instruction must change. So what we're really hoping is that people really dive into these documents and look at them and, and really understand them before they get started. And that can, that can just save a lot of time. 
Uh, I'll talk more about literacy in just a few moments, but I do want to let you know the National Council of Teachers for English has stated, um, as society and technology change, so does literacy. So I, I think we have some preconceived notions of what literacy means, and um, hopefully this webinar will clear that up a little bit for you. Uh, the, the next bullet there says when, when students experience powerful reading and writing instruction, they are far more likely to be successful in college and the workplace. And the, those two um, bullet points there are going to frame our, our discussion as we move forward. All right. So talk to a little more about this quote from Mike Schmoker, Lisa. What are you trying to um, convey here? Well, I think, you know, it, it says, what's essential for schools. And I think here's where principals and teachers on the line, just looking at this one particular quote, where are you at? And all three need to be in place. So are you hitting the ground with a coherent and sound curriculum? If not, where is your starting point in? What's going to be your roadmap? Do you feel uh, teachers have sound lessons to the Common Core? Um, is that going to be your starting point? Uh, and then, what are we talking about when we're talking about reading and writing in every discipline? Is literacy a key part K-12 conversation, not just K-5, but K-12? And those three things all kind of need to be um, set in place in order to really make some change. Okay, great. Here's what I'd like to talk about just for a few moments about what does it mean to be literate now. And I guess this is a question, if you're on the line, what if you pose that question to your staff or your department or your grade level team? Just the, just the question up on the screen. What kind of conversations do you think might occur? Or how might the people you're working with define this? And that's what I'm finding as I'm going around working uh, around the country and, and really digging into the Common Core and literacy is there is a shift with the Common Core of Literacy that, that people aren't quite wrapping their, their brains around yet. So I would just pose this as a, as a starting question. For example, at the secondary level, I have teachers saying, I'm not a reading teacher, I'm not a writing teacher, so maybe the view is still, you know, um, I just teach reading and writing. But I want to spend just a minute here and really giving you the key point that Literacy in our global, connected, uh, technology-rich, media-rich world is it's just so different than literacy in the past. And so we have to lay out this vision for our teachers of what it means to be literate now. And this is what the Common Core is just really pushing when they're talking about their, their college and career readiness, um, college and career readiness um, points or, or the characteristics of what makes a literacy. Uh, a literate individual today. And I, I don't want to go into all of them in detail, but there are seven characteristics. So I just want you to think, for those of you on the line, frame your mind around these seven characteristics and think, is this what should, we should be seeing in every single classroom? Students that demonstrate independence without a lot of scaffolding, so they're not being prompted. They can just demonstrate command of, of the language. They're self-directed learners. Students are building strong content knowledge, not only base knowledge, but they become proficient in new areas through research and study. The students are able to respond to varying demands of audience. They, they know how to adapt to their communication. They, they can teamwork. They can read an audience, but not just through speaking, but with their writing and their reading and listening. They can comprehend as well as critique. So we need students to understand more and at deeper levels, but not only that, but can they discern? Can they, can they be open-minded and, and critique what they're hearing? Uh, students need to be able to value evidence. So they need to be able to, to cite specific evidence when offering, and it could be oral or written interpretation of a text. Uh, this is one I love. Students you need to use technology and digital media. And I think we think students know it all, and, and, and maybe they're better at it sometimes than we are. But um, are they familiar with their strengths and limitations? and the strength and limitations of certain technological tools, and are they using them to enhance what they're doing or presenting, and not just um, kind of in the background as, uh, hey, I'm using technology. So, so that's, that's a one that uh, I find interesting. The last one is that students come to understand other perspectives and cultures. So when we're talking about literate 
individual today. We're talking about students that come to appreciate 21st century classroom settings where people often have widely divergent cultures and represent different experiences and perspectives, and they just need to learn to work together. So if we're, if we're thinking about that, does that sound like just reading and writing? So hopefully I painted the picture of what we're talking about when we're talking about literacy today. What do you think, Steve? I love it. And here's what I, I want to do. I, I want to, let's make this um, uh, more interactive here with our, with our listeners. So we're going to run through a, a series of three polls right now. I'll let Lisa describe these a little bit more in detail. Kathy is going to help us with the poll and the numbers. Um, so we have three um, polls we want to go through right now. And Lisa, do you need to expand on this one a little bit more? We kind of want to know who's on the line and how we can help you. So let's start off the first poll um, about the best description of your current department or position. And then, um, Lisa, we can go into the next one. You can let me know. Yeah, I think we can just, I think this is good. Just It might not pinpoint exactly your position right now, but what, what's the closest thing to you if you feel like you don't necessarily fit a category? We just, we just kind of want to see who our audience is. And this is Kathy. If everyone can use, uh, actually respond to the poll rather than your, your question function, if you can, that way you'll be included in the poll. I do see some uh, answering through the question function. Yeah, and about, this is great. We've got almost 80% of the people online have voted, so let's give them about another 20 seconds here to see if we can get most of the people to use the poll function. All right, so this is interesting then. We can see how um, people are distributed online here, which is a nice fair balance between central office down to coach and mentor. There's about 83% of you got that vote in. Um, would you like to roll through the next poll, Lisa? Well, actually, I'm just sharing it now so everyone okay. else can see the specific numbers, Steve. Wow, that's great. And I think with the literacy with the Common Core, we are seeing that E category, um, either literacy coaches, instructional coaches. Sometimes it's part-time teacher slash coach for an hour or two, um, mentor position really growing uh, in the last five years or so. What I find interesting is to see more of it um, starting to come through at the secondary level. Yeah, I think we can go on to the next poll. And this one is, I realize uh, not everyone online is an English teacher. And what I, what I would like you to do is just assess your school or even your district thinking about the English language arts teachers only. We're going to talk about the non-ELA teachers in the next poll question. So just for now, um, which look at A, B, C, D, E, and assess where you think your English teachers are the best that you can. Okay, this is really good too. We're just about 50% voted, so we'll let this go a little bit more and then we'll share the results once again. And, and Lisa, while everyone's for... answering, um, there is a question I know a number of people asked if perhaps we can in our download include the seven characteristics of the literate person as you outlined? Absolutely. So we will, everyone, put together a document outlining those because I do know a number of you have asked. All right, really good, up to about 83% vote. Do you want to share that, Kathy? OK, that's interesting. So we have about a fourth just learning now. And we have about a fourth need help with the lesson planning, which means you've learned about the, the Common Core standards. And you're kind of to that next step. Now, how do I? tie it all in. Um, still needing help with the strategies. Um, I see that E relating to probably a lot of coaches or uh, English teachers. Sometimes um, school districts are going to the English teachers and saying, OK, you need to help everyone else with, the, with literacy strategies. And that's not necessarily the English teachers have a lot on their plate in learning, too. So um, if, that, if you're finding yourself in that situation, that is something that um, we'll have to work out. I think the, the rest of the webinar might help you with that. I think yeah, we can go on you know, to the... 
Yeah. Like, this is the one that's going to I find interesting because as we travel around and we give this training, you know, the everybody knows that the Common Core literacy standards are really a shared responsibility between social studies, science, and techno, technical subject teachers. But the biggest issue I'm hearing, Lisa, is people saying, "Look, I'm not. I don't teach writing," which I think probably. Um, I don't think anybody can really say that anymore. I think the, since it's such a huge shared responsibility, we want to see where people are on this poll as well. How would you frame this, Lisa? Um, going to the going to the next poll or this particular one? Yeah, the one that we're on right now, the third poll. Okay. Oh, so we need. Can you click that ahead? We can't see that on the screen yet. There we go. Okay, so this is really for the non-ELA teachers. So describing if you're social-based, science, technical, subject teachers, or just thinking about those teachers in your school, where would you say they are at right now? So we're not talking about the English language arts teachers, but the rest of the teachers. And Steve, I love that because a lot of school districts have writing across the curriculum or reading across the curriculum in place, but there's never been standards before to put any weight behind that or how do you assess it or I know you prioritize a lot, so how do you prioritize that? So I think this is a good good poll to um, take here to see, see where everyone's at. Yeah, we're currently at about 65%. Let's go a few more seconds here and see if we can get um, close to our 80 and see where everybody is. While we're waiting, we have a, a question from Russell, and that is, how will PARC define literacy or literacy proficient? Uh, the PARC, so we have PARC and the Smarter Balance, and if you go on their websites, they address that. Um, a little bit, but what you want to start to look at also is how they, what are their items being released um, for test items. And so, for example, we're starting to see uh, writing is going to be a huge component on this assessment where state assessments in the past have either dropped writing or paid little attention. So we're seeing much more of an equal weight between reading and writing. And Russell, you can follow up with me via email. Uh, for more information on, on PARC. And, and Penny ahead. makes a comment, and then I'll, I'll launch the poll, but she says many, uh, many non-ELA teachers assign writing but do not teach writing. Mm, she's a step ahead of the game. I think a, a slide coming up soon when we get to writing is going to uh, hit that one on the head. Excellent. All right, so here are the results. And, you know, this is the thing. We've got a lot of people, Lisa, that are just learning about those literacy, social studies, science, and technical subject standards. I think this is critical if the Common Core gets launched with parity and sustainability. Absolutely, especially at the secondary level. And I, I don't mean to not say anything about K-5, but in K-5, the literacy standards are much more integrated. A uh, third grade teacher teaches you know, all subject areas and it is tend to focus, the literacy is much more intertwined, but it's that secondary level that we are seeing across the board that um, either, honestly, school districts are scared to get started or saying, I'm not sure how to roll this out, and just learning about the standards, taking that time to, to go into those documents and to really look at the writing standards, compare them to an ELA writing standard, you will see very little difference. So we're talking about really interdisciplinary literacy with, with some standards that give you the, the meat and, and how to assess this and work not as a team as here's the ELA versus the non-ELA, but how do we move forward together just like K, K5 has done for years. How do you bring that up 612? So this is, this is good to, to see that, that um, they're, they're starting to learn about it and I, I see the next one is then now what? I'm going to need help with some some teaching strategies that focus on that. And, and before we go on, there's another couple of questions that uh, I'd like uh, Lisa um, or Steve. Um, Gloria says, we have a high set of, uh, we have a set of high frequency academic vocabulary that students see in our state test. Is there a set of vocabulary words that Common Core uses that we could begin to teach our students? Boy, that's really interesting. If you look on you know, the Common Core doesn't necessarily put out the words. It puts out um, examples of tier tier one, tier two, tier three words. But if you go to, I don't know if she's, I didn't hear what state, but if you're in a smarter balance state and 
you go to there's a 72 page document out there right now um, that gives the sample um, test items and so forth but if you go all the way to the end <laughs> you skip to page 70 71 and it's the one of the last few pages they do give examples of academic vocabulary and there's a, a running list and that might be a great starting point again you can email me if you if you can't find it I can point you in the in the right direction. And before we move on, let's take uh, one um, question by Debbie, and that is the state of California are doing both Smarter Balanced and PARC. Don't you think mm -hmm. that will make things more confusing, and should this be allowed, and why? I think so. I think hopefully they will pick one or the other. Um, maybe they're just on the fence right now. That would be a good question for your um, DOE of, of California. <laughs> well, I'm from California, and that's, you know, um, you know, the California has always, you know, really always been into quantity. And we always think the more standards we have and the more things we do that there's going to lead, that, that's going to lead to better results. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, not specifically that, that question, but the observation of my state and other states about how to focus with the Common Core. Lisa, any key points here with their teaching practice? Do you want me to slide up to the next slide? Uh, here, really, here's the key point, and this is that teachers must align their teaching practices with the expectations of the Common Core. So in order for all students to become highly literate, so they're really going to have to know and understand that document. And, and here's what I'm finding. I don't know if you're finding this, Steve, but when I'm going around and doing this Common Core work and really looking at, the, at looking at the standards, what I'm finding is when I ask, do you know the standards, yes, they, they want to go right into, OK, now what with the teaching practices? My fear is that they, they don't have a true understanding of those documents, of the standards. How is it set up? How is it designed? How is it organized? When we talk about text complexity, do you truly understand what that means? When we talk about argumentative writing, do you, can you define that? You know that. You know the, the characteristics that make up an argument piece of, of writing. And there, there's just, I think some we're jumping too fast to the teaching practices, which is where, where we're hoping to go, especially if you've been implementing the Common Core. But, if you feel you don't have a true understanding of the standards, you need to take a big step back and start there and just give teachers time to really know those standards backwards and forwards first um, and, and then go on. And I love a quote. I'm just going to say a quick quote here before we go on. One of my favorite quotes now is, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I just love that, and I think that sets our mind of how our teaching practices need to, to change to kind of work, work with the times. All right. We'll go on so, more yep. questions, if I can quickly get yeah, these in here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Cynthia makes note that California is part of um, CBAC, not PARC. Um, and Steve, being from California, you might be able to address that. What, what, what was the, what was it focused uh, on? California is part of CBAC, S-B-A-C, not PARC. Yes. So that's smarter balanced. Balanced, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and well, then, hey, listen, I'm glad they picked one or the other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, let's see, there was another one here uh, in relation to Florida from Gloria. Do I understand that there will be four PARC tests given a year? Will these tests be average to get one composite score for students that is comparable to our state standards? Um, Florida, I'm trying to think if what what um, if I, you know. I, I, my understanding of the way Park is assessed is there there are those assessments throughout the year, but I thought one just had some of those some of those scores don't count towards accountability until until the final assessment. I, it could be wrong. I don't yes, want to. I, no, I'm green, Steve. Um, for for um, for both, it will be the 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 final assessment. So, for example, with Smarter Balance, it's that that last time frame. Now they might they're supposedly going to be making um, formative assessments. So students might take it in the beginning of the year, kind of as a practice for internal data. How great would that be for teachers to have something like that um, uh, to work with? Uh, but the, it, it will be that final assessment there. And uh, I, would, I would advise you to go on to parkonline.org or smarterbalance.org for more information. And um, again, just email if you want more, more on assessments. And, and I do know that quote of yours is um, definitely being asked for again. So perhaps 
um, when we sure. do that, the other document with the download, we can include that quote as well. Absolutely. Okay, and there are some more questions, but why don't we let you go on and we can come back to some of them. Well, the, you know, the basic reading shift, I, I think that I, I don't want to spend too much time here, and, and this is just to get us to think about how, um, you know, basically it says the reading standards place equal emphasis on the sophistication of what the students can read and the skill with which they can read. So it's not just that skill, but it's also the, the information, the sophistication. And, and I think, you know, as uh, Steve goes on to the next slide, it, it's, we hear that as text complexity. And so when people say, describe text complexity to me, we go over the definition and, you know, the, the three-part model on text complexity, what I, what I just say, let's just make it easy for a minute. Let's just think about the sophistication of what our students are reading today. So it's that both literary and, and informational text, we know more informational text is going to be a part of the, the broader picture um, across all grades and subjects. And, and here, here's what it comes down to. Our students must be able to read and understand deeply. So in the past, kind of with No Child Left Behind or the last 10 years, of, you know, fluent decoding and basic comprehension are just not sufficient anymore. We need our students reading for meaning. And that's, that's just got to happen now. And, and my question would be to, for everyone on the line to think, assess where your teachers are at now. Mm -hmm. What and how are students reading now? That would just be a simple question I would ask. So in a typical two-week period, what types of things are they reading? And if it's textbook only, uh, we need primary sources, secondary sources. So what are all the varied things? And then examine the text complexity and maybe go for there as a, as a starting point. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pause for a minute for you to, to uh, read this particular slide Steve just put up. And, are you finding yourself nodding? I know we can't see you, but I'm just wondering if you're reading this and think nodding along. I'll give you just a moment. Two main documents I would suggest if you haven't read them. First one is called the Reading Between the Lines, uh, ACT put that out, and what it shows us is that when students enter the workplace, deficiencies in reading achievement follow them, and we know 80% of businesses had a shortage of qualified job ca candidates, and they cite poor reading as the key reason. The other report that if you haven't looked at, Diploma to Nowhere, and that is Strong American Schools, that was in 2008, it says, here's, here's what I find fascinating. Uh, approximately 43% of all students at two-year institutions enroll in, in a remedial course. And you think, oh, if they go to university, it gets a lot better. 29% of all students at a university enroll in a remedial course. So that's the expectation of the Common Core. We started at the college level and went down. So the, the whole idea of college and career readiness means kids graduate from 12th grade and go into college or go into that career field, technical field, ready to hit the ground running, wiping out remedial courses. Think of all the money parents are going to save if we can, if we can just get our kids not to, to do that. That's a, that's a joy for me as I have a daughter going off to college soon. What do you think, Steve? I will, here, this is where I think it transitions perfectly to the next portion of the webinar because we want to talk about the level of rigor in the Common Core and the higher level thinking skills required of the kids, especially when we talk about the reading strategies. I know that you have some that we're going to talk about in the next slide or two, but I think here's what separates implementation of the Common Core from the clients I'm working with. They start looking at implementing the very best strategies that match the needs of the students, not what their very favorite strategy is. And so I think we're going to have to make some clear-cut choices now about how we implement the Common Core with research-based instructional strategies. I'll let you explain this a little bit more. I have a few more examples as we get into this. That's great. Uh, you, you just made, you made the point there, and that means that they're focused on really tearing up those Common Core standards and working through them. It, if you're, not only do we need better metacognitive learners, we need our students to think about their thinking. But when we're looking at the Common Core standards versus maybe your old state standards, for a lot of states, the rigor, uh, the, the level of blooms level, if you went up the level of blooms, you would see higher order thinking skills 
Um, so not only does the Common Core place more weight in the skills, so not just the concepts, but we're placing now more weight in the skills. So it's about what students can, can do with that knowledge. We, we can get knowledge today, but now what can you do with it? So there's more emphasis on the skills, but there's also a higher emphasis on critical thinking skills. So not just can they apply something, can they comprehend something, but now can they analyze it, can they evaluate it, can they do something new creatively with it? So um, that is, that's kind of what we're talking about there. Did you want to say anything before I just touch base no. on the reading strategies? I want, if we can answer some questions here if that's appropriate. I really want people to understand what the specific reading strategies are that will really match with the Common Core. Let's be honest, Lisa, you know as well as I do, just because we rolled out a new set of standards does not mean that these kids are magically at grade level. They are still right. kids in schools we work in that still need two to three years worth of growth. And so we're going to really have to pinpoint what they need to get them as close as possible to the new levels of rigor of the Common Core. I don't know, Kathy, are there any questions for um, Lisa to answer? We, we do have a number of questions. Um, I also know that we've been asked um, to, um, to hold them at the end because some have to leave and they want to make sure that um, we get all of the information in. So I will say a couple, but everyone, please know those at which we cannot answer right now, you will receive uh, personal emails with responses. So if we don't get to them on air, don't worry about it. You will be hearing from us and we will respond. Um, let's. Um, uh, take a look here and say uh, a lot of these are comments. Um, will the content area teachers have their names attached to the scores of the smarter, uh, smarter balance test like the ELA teachers will? Yeah, that's, we don't know that yet. They have not put out that information. It's a wait and see game. And then Susan asks, what is the difference between a field test in 2013, 14 year, uh, 2014 year and the pilot test? That's a great question. I'm not, I think field test is when they are um, trying out certain, you know, that's a really good question. Steve, I'm not sure if I no, can we'll, answer that. We'll go ahead and research that. We'll get back to that for Susan okay. for sure. I don't know if that's my friend Susan, but we can definitely um, okay. um, get back on that one. Um, I wanted to just get, you know, focus on the, the reading strategy piece here and then the, yeah. the um, writing um, portion. And then we again we can follow up on that. I, you know, field test for me means they're you know we're we're looking at some kind of launch, and then going to the full implementation. So we can we can definitely find that out for you as well. Okay, and just to pick up on the reading strategies for those of you who may be um, have been staring at this slide, you could just jot down uh, um, Lee and Spragley um, if you if you wanted more on, on these and you could even Google that and come up with more. But I just want to give the example right now is when, when I'm going out and working with schools and they're saying, hey, we are, first of all, we're working, do you understand the Common Core Standards? Do, you, do we have a, have a grip on that? And then, you know, have you prioritized them? Because as Steve said, we, we have to, we can't do it all. The kids don't magically come up to us, you know, ready to go. So let's, let's just prioritize a few to start working on. And if we could do it vertically and use that spiral effect, that's awesome. But with the reading strategies, it's just the generic reading strategies are starting points. And if you're thinking, what, I'm not sure what those are. For example, I'm talking about pre-reading, setting goals, um, asking students to think about what you know, ask questions, making test predictions, reread, summarize, those kinds of things. Um, you know, comprehension strategies, it's a good starting point. But we have to get more specific, especially at the secondary level. So not, I mean, you know, this, this does, it is K-12. But I think for a lot of people um, across the country, we're just at the secondary level, so nervous about moving forward. And a lot of this is going to help teachers help their students get better at understanding the, the content. So more discipline-specific strategies and less of the general. So we have to take these strategies uh, a step further. And we'll switch over here to writing. Steve? Well, I think one of the things I love about what Mike Schmoker's newest book, which is called Focus, says that, um, look, teachers will only be able to effectively teach half of the Common Core. Now, the key word here is effective. But one of the things the Common Core and the expectations for in Common Core literacy standards and writing, I think these new levels of nonfiction writing are apparent throughout the entire document. And I'll let Lisa talk a little bit more about this. But 
there are all kinds of ways to implement writing across the curriculum. You don't have to be a, you know, a seasoned writing professional to add more writing to your class right now, especially if you're social studies or technical subjects. They can do entrance and exit slips. They can do argumentative writing. There's all kinds of things that students can do right now to begin writing more. And we're going to show some research what that looks like. But what were some of the key points for you about writing, Lisa? I think, and this is a comment Kathy uh, said earlier on the line that, that somebody uh, typed in. Uh, and that was, uh, I love the, the case for teachers, teaching writing. If I could take it a step further, I'd say versus assigning writing. So we need to make a case for teaching writing versus assigning writing. And I think a lot of teachers, myself included when I was an English teacher for years, uh, the mentality of it meant, oh, students need to write more. We assign more, but don't necessarily take the time to teach it. Uh, two quotes I want to I wanna, um, bring to your attention, and I will make sure, Kathy, I get them on that um, uh, handout we'll, we'll send out to people. But uh, one is, Writing, writing is seldom assigned and even more rarely taught. I love that. And Daniel Graves, um, who's a, if you, if you haven't heard of him, he's just a writing researcher god to me, but he admits, at one point I realized I didn't teach, I just corrected. And George Hillox, especially for folks out there, you want something really good on argumentative writing. His argumentative writing book is, is amazing. I, I found it very helpful. Um, he just, he, his studies found that teachers spend an average of only three minutes in assignment before cutting kids loose to write. So we've got to make the, teach, the case for teaching writing, not just assigning it. Well, and here's where I think um, the 909090 research comes into play. For those of you that aren't familiar with the 909090 schools, these are schools that are 90% diversity with 90% free and reduced lunch, and students that were testing 90% um, average or proficient on state assessments or large-scale assessments. And if you can look at the five correlates based on that research, you know, we've got nonfiction writing here, emphasis on written responses and performance assessments. The thing that I love about all five of these correlates is this is just what schools should be doing right now with the Common Core. I think um, the Common Core with a level of rigor allows students to have more opportunities to demonstrate proficiency instead of just saying, look, I taught it, you didn't get it. If we don't modify the multiple opportunities assessment piece and the nonfiction writing, we're going to have a lot of kids struggling. Now, here's why you should believe this research. First of all, it's based on four years of data from 1995 to 1998. It's a little old. There's lots of new research that still substantiates this. But this involved 130,000 students in 228 buildings in inner city to rural to even economically advantaged. The, the, the what I love about the 9990 school process is these are things that we can start doing right now because I have to tell my friends right now, and this is especially for my leadership friends on the phone, I'm a former superintendent. For teachers in the Common Core, let's just understand that there is no evidence that frantic coverage of everything leads to better results. In fact, the research that we're looking at right now says more focus, less clutter for teachers is actually going to lead to better results in terms of um, student cognition. So as we look, about, look at implementing the literacy standards for the Common Core and all ELA standards, understand that the greatest gift leaders can give to teachers right now is the not to do list, which means that for every new initiative we implement, like going deeper with the Common Core, we're probably going to have to eliminate two to three ineffective initiatives. Otherwise, you're going to maintain the status quo. We've got to go deeper with fewer. And I always tell people, especially if they're decision makers, we're going to have to start learning how to say no to um, off-mission activities. I always tell people, you know, one of the things I learned when I was a superintendent was not trying to implement too many things at the same time. And I don't know if anybody else has tried this crazy diet. I once gave up sugar 30 days in a row. And, you know, this was hard for me. I'm Italian, Lisa, and that means no pasta or bread. But after trying to give up sugar for 30 days straight, um, this is what this is what day 31 looked like for me. And so my point is, is that we've got to chunk out the way we implement the Common Core. We've got to have the focus on those five correlates from, from the 90-90-90 study. And I'm telling you, the schools and organizations I'm working with right now, when they decide what they're going to focus on and they eliminate some of these off-mission activities, they immediately see results. Now, I know you've seen the same thing. But the message here with the Common Core is to really go deeper with fewer. We've talked about prioritizing the Common Core. A lot of people believe that every single standard has the same importance with the same depth and breadth. 
Well, if you can have perfect coverage of the Common Core for one full school year, good luck. Because the people we're working with right now, if they cover every single standard, great. But they are also leaving kids behind. And I, I just want to make sure that we understand that when we implement a new set of rigorous standards. So I know we're going to go into the writing shift, Lisa. What kind of key points do you have here? Yeah, and I'll, I'll make it quick because I know we're, we're down to about our last uh, five minutes or so. But, you know, the writing shift, if you... The writing shift really for, for the Common Core, I think for most people, is nonfiction writing. And by nonfiction, that, that is something that at the center we've been, we've been saying, Reza has been saying for years, but it's kind of like, oh, the Common Core has finally caught up to, to the research. And I think for a starting point, as people are prioritizing, usually, typically in the schools, we've got narrative down. Um, expository, which is the, the old term now for the new common core term, informative explanatory, we, we, we've got some understanding of that. I think a prioritized standard or a starting point for people when it comes to writing is the what is an argument, that argumentative writing. It's not necessarily always, pers or persuasive writing is not always necessarily argumentative writing. And so what are the key elements of argument writing how is it different than persuasive writing? And really, with argument writing, it means students have to go back to the text. They have to cite evidence. So it's not writing separate in its own category, but we're now talking about writing from reading. So reading and writing go together, and the Common Core takes it a step further and talks about speaking and listening and language. So we, we getting students writing is a starting point. We need much more writing. And I'll leave this quote up just for a moment. You'll see that key sentence at the end. But if you would just go ahead and click on to the next one, Steve, just to get to the writing strategies. And I think when we're talking about writing strategies and where to start, a lot of people think product writing only. By that at the center, when we talk about product writing, you'll see the examples listed there. They think every teacher now has to give essays. Every teacher now has to give huge research papers. Every, right? So something that takes them through the, the entire process, but they, they're, they're thinking more of an essay or a long paper, that kind of thing. But we think about this. Both are important. Look at the writing to learn. And with the writing to learn, it's, that means um, generally uh, writing to learn activities are short, impromptu, informal writing tasks. But that's what helps students think through key concepts or ideas presented in your course or your subject area. So just writing to learn, these quick writing strategies, that is where students are really going to do that metacognition work. That's where they're going to think about their thinking. Because it's through writing, writing as a technique to learn content, is how we're going to develop them, uh, develop their skills as thinkers. So. Don't be scared with more writing and think, oh, everyone has to do an essay. It could be a KWL. It could be an entrance exit slip, like Steve was saying. But yes, we, we are going to have to do more product writing. But in science, that means maybe a better, stronger lab report based on writing standards. And it could be, you know, in, um, in the social studies classroom, it could be a really good summary, precise summary, not an opinion, but, but a summary citing evidence, you know, bringing other things in. So, it looks different. It has to be more discipline specific, but I think we can get there. So the combination of both. You know what I've seen, Lisa, just for elementary, is the combination um, of Cornell notes. And I've seen teachers use combination notes where the left-hand side of the paper is for key points, but then the kids make uh, use non-linguistic images to support those key points. They're still writing more. It's not as um, sophisticated as Cornell notes. But it's it's a it's a, a slant on Corno notes that works works really well. I can show people an example if they want to see what that looks like. But they're 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 really really a great way to implement writing. And we understand that there's going to be you know either writing to learn or learning to write. But we want to make sure that kids are just writing. That's what's going to get folks um, to okay. help um, implement the core even better. So what's the roadmap, Lisa? Yeah, you know, and that's creating the roadmap there is, is where are you at? And that goes back to the poll we asked you to take in the beginning. Some of you are just starting to learn about the standards. Take the time to go deep into the standards. Where's your starting point? What, what can you prioritize, as Steve was talking about earlier? What, 
and then just take a few, but take it all the way through. Don't just understand your students. Know what's coming the grade level before you. Know where your students need to go after they exit that grade level. And then as you're thinking about lesson planning, thinking about what is the best strategy. Are your strategies you're using too general? Do you need to get more specific? If you don't have a strategy in place, in place maybe it's just starting with a general one because that's your starting point. But it's really assessing where you're at. The end goal here with reading and writing is to get more discipline specific and move past the general. It's also we have to support our teachers because with the Common Core there was no magic wand that taught us that said how and they didn't. They left it up to us to decide how are we going to teach these and we're all in different places across the country. So you have to find that access point in and, and just take it from there. Find out what you're doing well, celebrate that, keep doing that, but then where does the teaching practice have to change? With these Common Core rigorous standards for college and career readiness and, and the new way we're thinking about literacy now, there's going to have to be some changes in the classroom, but it's not just local, it's not just your state, it's now many states, almost all of our states, and it's really moving forward as a, as a nation, and that's what I think is exciting. Uh, that we're not in this alone. Well, I, I, I have to say the learning progressions and the, and, and the grade level standards are so specific. There is a specific trajectory that each student follows. But whenever I do a prioritizing or unwrapping seminar, the best feedback I ever get from teachers was, we were asked to read the standards before our grade level and after our grade level to ensure vertical alignment. And that was the big aha. Once teachers saw what students had to have before they got to them, it really, really stressed about what the focus was for them on that year. So let's go ahead and see if we can answer a few more questions and then um, bring things to a close. I just wanted to remind everybody one last time, um, hey, we'd love to meet you in person, all of us. Lisa and I, again, will be in, in Charlotte on April 24th and 25th. We've got some great upcoming seminars for the, um, for the um, standards, uh, Common Core State Standards Summit as well with Larry Ainsworth and Dr. Perry. So hopefully we can um, see you folks out there. So Kathy, I know you've got a few more questions. Let's see if we can I, do those I, right now. I do. And actually, um, what um, and we would also like you to tell us what additional webinars you would like, and perhaps um, on your question function, and that would be great, helping us to plan. And if you can go to the last uh, slide, Steve, as well. Um, we recognize that you are all in different stages of implementation and that each of you is listening with an ear to what, what you are looking for. And some are, are more local basis, some are more national basis, which is why we encourage you to, to write Steve or Elisa um, for any questions that you have that will help you in your, your specific path uh, as it relates to those discussions you'd like to have with your leadership team. And we are here to help you as well. And for any questions that you might have in regard to any of our upcoming conferences or our seminars, on-site seminars, please um, uh, write to our national sales manager, uh, whose email uh, you will see listed here as well, um, Kyle Helfrich at hmhco.com. And he will be able to help you as Steve and Lisa will as you, you know, are on your journey toward the implementation of the Common Core Standard. Yeah, Kyle's a good guy. So is Lisa. <laughs> and and we will, we will um, be posting within the next 48 hours um, this presentation. And please know we will get to you personally on all those questions because you had some great ones that we didn't get to, but we will do so after the webinar. Okay, so um, Kathy, are we, are we going to go ahead and just try to get to those on a, on a, on a personal level? And exactly. The rest of the exactly. Okay, well everybody, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. We had a great group. We had over 400 people online. Um, thank you so much for, for, your, for your participation. Let us know how we can support you. And good luck everybody. We hope to see you soon. Take care now.